We're looking at one left there. Yeah, I got one. Thank you. This is kind of a two part thing. We're having six sessions for first timers. On the first of the six sessions is going to be on the Beatitudes. That's just 12 verses. And we all over the course of some point in time through vacation Bible school or whatever, we've learned blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble in spirit, blessed are, and, and we see this in a number of uh, in a number of the of a spiritual writings. Some people quote them, some churches have them as something that they talk about all the time in terms of, of their their services. But we're going to spend six weeks on those 12 verses. Then we're going to spend six weeks on the rest of the Sermon on the Mount because those 12, those 12 verses introduce the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the first sermon Jesus gives in his earthly ministry. And it is the, if we understand it, if we listen and study that sermon, then we, then we see him take it and apply it the rest of his ministry. He takes things that he talks about in that sermon, and, and we see it used in the rest of the book of Matthew. We see it used in Luke. We see it referenced in Mark. We see it John references it because it's the foundation of his ministry. It's the foundation of his, his kingdom. So let's set the stage just a second. Just to keep everybody on track. What we've talked about so far in verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 is that he draws, he draws a multitude to him. They're, they're there. They're, they're wanting to listen to what he has to teach. And he brings his, by now he's got his 12, we call them apostles, his 12 disciples. Matthew, I mean, uh, yeah, well, Matthew, but, but uh, Peter and and uh, John and James and, and the, the twelve disciples, and he brings them, and he he brings them before him. He goes up on this this mountain that's kind of like the mountains of southeastern Oklahoma. We call them mountains, but they're just high hills. But compared to Colorado and places like that, but he gets up on the side of this high hill off the Sea of Galilee, and he sits down. Now that's all in custom to what master teachers did. That's how they taught. When the master teacher got to teaching his disciples, he, he would sit down with them. And when he sat down, that was the signal. Pay attention. It's time to learn. And so he, he sets, sets them down. He's got them in front of him. He's got a multitude listening to him. And he begins to teach. But by teaching, he's preaching. And sometimes we need to understand that those two things go together. On a Sunday morning between... No, I'm not going to say that. For a period of time on Sunday morning, sometimes it's longer than others, sometimes it's shorter. We are being preached to. But if we listen carefully, we're also being taught. Because the purpose of preaching is to teach, to bring us together in God's Word. Now, he does this, and this is how he begins it. Matthew, fifth chapter, uh, he comes to them, and when he saw the multitudes, he went up to the mountain, and after that, he... He sat down and his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he began to teach them, saying, and it's going to get preachy here in a little bit because the next six weeks after this period of time's up, he's going to talk, start talking about some things they, they needed to learn about being Christ followers. And it got, the application part gets kind of sticky because it catches us where we live. But that's the that's but he sets the stage by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And he, and he goes through this series. We talked about those two things last week. 
So again, and just setting the stage, let's understand. These 10 blessed are statements are spiritual statements. We look at them and, and we say, well, blessed are the uh, blessed are the are the uh, poor in spirit. Does that mean the people don't have any money? No. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. Let's understand something. God is a God of order. And God, when he comes as Jesus, is a is still in order. He is not a God of chaos. He's not a God of disjointed things. He's not a God of piecing and pulling and putting things together. He's a God of order, not a God of chaos. And so when he starts to say something and he has these 10 statements that he gives, they are statements of order. They come in a, it, it, it's not, he just didn't haphazardly say, well, let's talk about the poor in spirit. No, 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 we'll put them first, and then we'll talk about these other people over here, and then we'll talk about this over here. No. The first one is the foundation, is the starting point. That's the building block that you're going to take and put the next one on. And then the next one's going to sit on top of it. And the next one's going to sit on top of it. So that as we go through these, we have to have the right foundation to understand what the next one is going to do as it applies to us. That's the first point you want to keep in mind in all of these. The second point you want to keep in mind is he's not talking about earthly wealth or earthly happiness or earthly uh, uh, humbleness or earthly meekness. Or anything. He's not talking about that. The nature of man, with as it applies to those words, is not the realm he's teaching in. Jesus is God. God is spirit. This is a spiritual realm that he's, he's identifying and talking about. So when he says, first off, poor in spirit, he's talking about those who who are not close to God in spirit. And they need to be drawn close to God. So we're talking about we're talking about that what draws us to God if we're poor in spirit. The underlying thing, and I think uh, I, I think uh, uh, Wanda. Wanda. Yeah. <laughs> Raylene, you messed me up. <laughs> we were not sitting next to Chuck. <laughs> so, it's, I, how do I remember Wanda's name? Chuck and Wanda. <laughs> Chuck and Raylene didn't go uh, away. This doesn't matter. So it's got me a now that I'm confused. Who sits next to Raylene? You're all Wanda, right, Sometimes I don't remember my name either. <laughs> <laughs> Humility. Humbleness. That's what we're talking about in this first verse. So we carry, what's, what's humbleness? That doesn't seem like that's a very spiritual thing. But we're going to see it again in verse 5. And that's where we're going to start today. So the foundational block that we're going to talk about. Oh, that we, oh, what happened? I spilled the coffee. Okay. Hang on. I'll go. See it. I'll go. Be there. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to run. Right <laughs> the two of them together, I'm telling you, this will be. They're going to get lost. <laughs> you didn't hear the story. I just wanted to fly up on Friday night after we left. <laughs> Way behind, so let's get started. I've talked too much. That's it. You're going to need a whole roll of paper and clean up one little spot. 
That's not what it was about. It's a whole cup. Okay. He told me to give it to Wanda to clean up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ain't that dumb. You know, I didn't have control really to start with. But I really didn't lose it. You have these notes in front of you not because of anything you do. If I've learned anything as I've gotten older, I've I have a passion for sharing what I've gotten out of this with you. And I know I can't do it adequately with words that will bear and stay with you. So I, I write notes that if you're interested, you take these and don't try to remember what I say, but this will help you go through and see some of the things I've seen in here. I learn more, and I've learned more in this study than all the years I've been in Sunday school, and all the years I went to OBU, and all the years I did all that other stuff. I've learned more about the Beatitudes in the last month than I've been exposed to in the last 50 years. And I get passionate about that because I know I don't have all these years left to share this with. And I know I don't have the language and the skill to be able to project it in the way it should be. So I, the notes are really there for a real purpose. If you're interested, you've got something to look at that has been a journey that I've gone through. These are not all my words. I'm not smart enough to put this stuff together. I take different authors and commentaries and pull stuff together and do things. But but that's why you got them. You don't want them? Fine. Toss them. That's fine. But I put them together this way for that reason. From the beginning of his earthly ministry, Jesus tossed concepts not recognizable to the Jewish population. Jesus comes to this mountain and he's talking about the kingdom of God. It's a new kingdom. It's not what the Jews expected. They had a kingdom. They had the, the promised land. And they had messed it up. And, and they thought about this Messiah coming and, and leading them back to be a great nation again, powerful and economically uh, stable, and everybody got rich and all of that kind of stuff. And they were a favorite lady. They, wouldn't want, they weren't going to be slaves to anybody. They were going to be back to a powerful and great nation again. And Jesus comes back and says, that ain't the kingdom I'm talking about. The kingdom I'm talking about is the one that's going to be eternal. The kingdom I'm talking about is the one that's going to be with God the Father, where he's going to be there. And that makes sense when you take then and put this to, we are going to be humbled before the throne of God. The whole thing, if you don't get anything else about the, about the Beatitudes is, as long as you're looking at yourself, you can't see God. As long as you're acting for yourself, you're not going to please God. As long as you're projecting yourself on others, you're not testifying of God. You're not letting God shine through. And so all of the Beatitudes, don't get anything else about it, is turned, what's the name of the song? Turn your eyes upon God, and it will drive you to your knees. It'll drive you to humility, foundational block, and it will drive you to be more Christ-like. Now others will see Jesus in you. That's the song, and that's what it is. And so let's look at this. I want to get into this. You've got some notes there. Read through that stuff. It'll be good. We're not going to get into all this. All right. Verse 5. I, I have a whole bunch of scripture in there. If you'll follow through those scriptures I've given you in there, you'll see some backup scripture to, to a lot of this. Blessed are the, no, blessed are the poor spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Fifth verse. Blessed are the gentle. Some of you will have in your scripture... Depending on the version you have, it'll be trans translated meek. 
I want you to look at that word, gentle. It means mild or soft, as soothing medicine or a soft breeze. Some of you take a, a, a salve and rub it on a sore, and it, and it comforts you. Well, it's that kind of gentleness. Meekness does not mean does not mean weak. It rhymes with weak, but it doesn't mean weak. But we want to make it that way. The nature of man says to be meek is to be is to be a coward back and, and that kind of thing. And that's not what this means. When God says, Jesus says, uh, blessed are the meek or the gentle. <coughs> That denotes those who don't act out in vicious revenge. That's those who can absorb what the world throws at them. Through the power of, of, of Christ, we don't react like the world reacts. Blessed are the, are the gentle, for they shall inherit the wor world. Now, the world says... Blessed are the strong, blessed are the powerful, for they shall be kings and they'll be they'll be rulers and they'll be they'll be rich and powerful and, and they'll oppress. That's what the world how, how it looks. But Jesus says, happy, blessed, happy are the gentle, for theirs will be the inheritance of the new kingdom. This new kingdom. Christ will come in Revelation. He will put his foot on the face of the earth. He will inherit and sit on his throne and the new kingdom. But those who have Christ in their hearts, those who have Christ as their as their mentor their savior living in them will display gentleness softness okay tender heartedness okay when you look at uh, I, I, a couple points on this one I want you to see in that very first one poor in the spirit it focuses on sin we talked about that and meekness focuses on God's holiness. Humility or is the same core to both of those. When we look at ourselves, we're made to see how sinful and unworthy we are. I'm not worthy to be in the presence of God. I'm not good enough to be in the presence of God. I see sin in my life. That's the that's when we're we're looking at sin and comparing to sin. But when we talk about how gentle or how meek we'll inherit, that reverses that process. If you're looking at yourself, you're seeing sin and how unworthy I am. When you're gentle, when you're meek, you just turn it around and you're looking at God and seeing how worthy He is. How He's to be glorified because He is worthy. I look at sin, I'm unworthy. I look at God, God is worthy. God is being glorified in that. So it's building on this thing of humility. I'm humbled at how unworthy I am, and I'm certainly humbled at how worthy God is. He's my king. So you have you have this contrast, and it's and it's simply a matter of what's the object that we're looking at. The first one's looking at sin. The third one we turn and look at God. Keep that in mind. When we're looking at God, we're humbled to see how, how righteous and worthy he is. So it's a logical sequence. Verse 1 is poverty in spirit. It's negative. What does it result in? It results in the second one, which is mourning. I see how unworthy I am. 
I mourn, I grieve over how unworthy I am. What's it going to do? It's going to cause me to change. When I turn and look at God and I see how worthy he is and how he is, he is to be glorified, then it makes me go to number five, four. Seek after righteousness. I'm unworthy and I mourn. I agree. He is worthy and I seek him. That's the, that's the order that you want to see this in. That's the, that's the direction you want to get out of it. And that's the way you want to apply it to your lives. So let's look at this. Let's look at some things about this thing about meekness. Uh, there's a whole lot of passages here, but we're not going to look at all of them, but uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, it's, it's in the New Testament. Meekness does not connote uh, weakness. It means power under control. The literal word for... for uh, I'll get back over here. For, for meek or gentle is praos. We looked at it on that last chart. Praos, what country folks, is the word that would be used to break a wild horse. Did that horse change size? No. Did it change color? No. Did it change any of its any of its physical? It has four legs. It's got a mane. It's got head. It's got all that. It didn't change. That didn't change. Well, what changed? We took the power of the wild horse and we bridled it. We controlled it. It now has the same power it had before, but it's power under control. That, could apply, that applies to you and I. Before I had Christ in my life, we could sit here and enumerate terrible things, but the point is, in God's eyes, I'm just a lot of power out of control. But when we surrender to Christ, we have the same power but it's under his control. So, so what Jesus used here was a word they would have understood. How do you tame the wild animal? How do you tame it? How do you bring that power and all of the benefits that that wild animal has? How do you bring it under control? Through the power of God. Through the power of God. So that's that's the word he used in, uh, in that. It's breaking of an animal. It's using those resources to do that. It's the opposite of violence and, and vengeance. It's not it's not weakness, it's it's, it's or a lack of convi conviction. I said it's courage, strength, and conviction. The spirit of meekness is the spirit of Christ who defended the glory of his father, but gave himself for the sacrifice of others. When you read the scripture, is think about this. He is Christ's Son, God in man, incarnate. God in man. He had the power to call 10,000 angels. Your favorite song? One of your favorite songs. To 10,000 angels, take him off the cross. But he didn't. He didn't. Well, he just was weak. No. He was under control to obey his father. Lord, take this cup from me, but I will do your will. And God's will was he goes through the cross. <coughs> now, this is the same Jesus. Let's understand this. This is the same Jesus who got mad. In the, in the, in the, in the temple, he goes into the courtyard. And there's these people in there, and they're making money off of selling the animals to be sacrificed, and they're they're exchanging their Roman coins for 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 Hebrew currency and making money off of it. The money changers. What did he do? He threw the tables over and chased them out of there. Choose your battles. Choose what's worth getting upset over. And 
then he didn't defend himself. He could have, but he didn't. And that's, that's power under control. That's gentleness. That's meekness. How many times do you come to church and you see something you don't like? I'm never going to put up with that again. I'm going to leave. I'm going to do this. I'm going to whatever we're going to do. And we get upset about something or other. They change the color of the carpet. And I'm just... Does <laughs> it make any difference? That's not the battle you want to fight. That's not the battle you want to fight. We want to, we want to yearn. Humble ourselves. To take the gospel to the person next door that needs Jesus as their Savior. That's what power is. And that's under control. Okay, let's go on. Always happens. I have two hours worth of stuff. 45 minutes. What's the necessity of meekness? Well, first of all, if you read Psalms 149 4, especially Matthew 18. Two, two, three, and four. It's necessary for salvation. That power under control is necessary for salvation. Power out of control has no place in the house of God. Has no place in the presence of God. As a matter of fact, power out of control will not be present in God's kingdom. That which we're going to inherit. So it's it's. It's necessary and it's commanded. Uh, we cannot witness effectively without it. Then I, I put a statement in here that uh, I can't figure out how that thing goes. Meekness is necessary because we cannot witness effectively without it. Pride will always stand between our testimony and those to whom we testify. What am I? What are you saying, Jim? They don't know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. They're not going to listen to you just because you know something. Because they're going to see you. They're going to see me. So if I say you all uh, smile every day when you see Billy, I didn't say laugh, just smile. Okay. Everybody we see. But I don't laugh at Billy. I talk about Billy. He do. I do. <laughs> They're listen to what I say. They're gonna see what I do. If what I do doesn't reflect what I say, then it's meaningless. So we have to be careful. And that's what he's saying. That's what Jesus is telling his disciples. They have to, the unsaved has to see Jesus in the saved. Or they won't see Jesus at all. So he's, that's what he's telling them in this. Pride. They, if they see somebody other than Jesus in us, then they're basically looking at, we've got power, I've got knowledge, I've got something you don't have, ha, ha, ha. And, and that's what they see. And it will become a blind between what you're trying to do, what you think you're trying to do, and what they actually see. And it'll be pride. And that's the opposite of humility. And that you, this entire thing's built on humble ourselves. Turn from that to this. And that's true humility in the face of God. We're not worthy to be in His presence. Is this the way the Israelites felt when God revealed Himself to them? Oh, well, sure. I, how did Moses, a good example, 
Moses comes down off of the mountain and the children, we all know the story. They made a golden calf and Moses is up there getting the Ten Commandments and, and what did Moses do? Killed 3,000. Uh, yeah. Before he did that, he did. What did he do? Before? Yeah. Took that, yeah. Broke, Bam. Broke the, uh, you crazy people, you come out of there. I've been up there 40 days and I'm just, I'm hungry and I'm like, all right, I'm hungry. And you built a golden calf. What are you thinking? You got mad. You got out of control. Why didn't Moses go into the promised land? God wouldn't let him. Why? Why? Because he didn't obey. Yeah, hit the rock. Hit the rock. You people keep yelling about being thirsty. I'll show you there's water in that rock. What? 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 God says, go over and hit that rock one time. And all the water you want will be there. Lord, I'm tired of messing with this bunch. What? 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 No, they got water. But Moses paid a price for that. What they saw in Moses wasn't the reflection of obedience to God. <coughs> That's <clears throat> kind of rolled into this. You've got, you've got to be obedient to God. I had no idea where we are. Uh, necessity of weakness, manifestation. Is that next? No, that was before. before. That was before? <laughs> I don't even know where we are now, Rob. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. I just... Well, uh, in parallel to this journey, they were told to go into the land and, and want the people in there to see what they were like and wanted to join them, wanted to be yeah. part of them. He skipped that. So here we are. He skipped the same that. Uh, That's why I'm lost. Show that yeah. so the people want to be involved. Let's let's look at this next one. Okay. And see how this applies to that. Let's go to let's go to five six. Yeah. <laughs> he see we have it. He has them in order. There's, there's 13 of them, I think, in order. He has them in order. But for some reason, when he puts them on the stick for this thing, they're on this stick. This, the TV, he takes them out of order. He was in here trying to mess with it and get them back. They're, they're perfectly fine on his computer. They're copied down and all in the heat. But they, it changes the order. Don't ask me. That's why I was having trouble last week. All right. Matthew 5, 6. So the next one then says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Okay, let's look at this. This beatitude speaks of spiritual desire, driving pursuit, not physical gratification. Any of you ever been hungry? I didn't say starving. Any of you ever been hungry? Yeah, right now. Yeah. <laughs> you, le you left egg muffins back there on the table. Uh, Anybody ever been thirsty? Sure. Every day? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a physical desire that we have. Our bodies tell us when we hunger. Sometimes they tell us when we hunger and we're really not. We don't have any need, but, that, but that's not it. Our bodies tell us. You ever take a, what's the old adage about uh, you can lead a horse to Water, but you can't make him drink. Can you ever make him stop drinking? But what's the adage say? You can't make him drink, right? So if he's full, can you take a horse that's just come from the water and trough, lead him around the pen and bring him back and make him drink? We tend to, when we're full, we go so far, and then that's, we stop. Can I make you eat something? Now, when we're hungry, we'll eat. We'll eat until we push back from the table, lots of times. But the kicker is, can we feed it more? Only if it has a desire for more. Here he's talking about spiritual things, because I'm
He says, I want you to hunger and thirst for right standing. Righteousness means right standing. Right standing with God. That's, that's what it says. And there you have a desire, a hunger, a thirsting. He's, he's applying physical attributes that they would be familiar with. They were all hungry. They all got thirsty every day. And they went to get water or they went to get something to eat uh, as, as, they, as they could. And they would eat till they were filled, and then they they push away. Now he says, "I want you to hunger and thirst for right standing with God, and only He can satisfy that. Only He can satisfy that hunger and thirsting. And it's a continuous thing that it's never satisfied until we're with Him." Just stop and think about that. Attended a funeral yesterday. Going to Virginia a long time. She finally doesn't hunger and thirst for righteousness. I believe she was saved. I believe she's in the arms of God. And I think that righteousness has been fulfilled. She's in right standing with God. How many times have we experience that in our own lives, our own family. So the only time this thing is finished is when we're in with the king. The king is the only one that can satisfy that. But the difference, the people sitting there are applying this to uh, I eat till I'm full and then I don't need it anymore. I may want some more of it because it tasted good later. I eat Dr. Pepper or I eat Cheez Its and drink Dr. Pepper. Hunger. I hunger and thirst for Cheez Its and Dr. Pepper every day. But at nine o'clock at night, I satisfy it and I've got enough and I quit. All right? But the next day, I want it again. God says, forget the Cheez Its and Dr. Pepper, okay? I want you to hunger and thirst. For coming alongside me. Now, how do we come alongside God? Rob, I'm so far off, you, you'll never find me. <laughs> <laughs> how do you come alongside God? You read His Word. We pray. We fellowship together. We study together. I hunger. For this class. I hunger for the time that we can get together and talk about God's work. It's not going to be satisfied until I'm with God. Don't you dare mourn the day I'm gone. I'm going to be satisfied. That's what he's telling them. He's telling them. Hunger and thirst, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Not because of anything some rabbi taught them or some synagogue leader was leading them or some Torah reading that was taking place or some ritual that they were performing or some sacrifice that was taking place. That wasn't satisfied. It, it was soothing for a time, maybe. But that wasn't the thing that was going to give them eternal satisfaction. That's only going to come for God. And he says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst, natural desire, I want more, I want more, I want more, I want more, for they shall be. That's a promise. That's a promise of God. Jesus is making it in this sermon. He's prepared to give them some hardcore stuff that they're going to have to apply to their lives, and it's not going to be easy. And, and to be able to hear it, you've got to be in this frame of mind. And so, so you get ready, because the only way from where you are to where he is is you've got to have these attributes, humility, 
You've got to be meek, mild. You've got to be starving for. I put some in the notes. I put some more stuff in there. Uh, and, and it leads with that. So I'm trying to get out of here. All right. I put in here every person was created at of the necessities. <laughs> Poor Rob. I bet he's, he's, he's just. Hunger and thirst of the necessities of spiritual life, just as righteousness is required for spiritual life, it is not optional. Every person was created with a sense of inner emptiness and need. If we ever have to demonstrate something to someone, as long as I'm looking at myself, and I can do it, and I can take care of it, and I can, I can, I'm independent, and I'm all I need. And that's what the world wants us to hear today. That's what the world wants. Be all you can be. And if that's, if that's good, Karen, just be all you can be. And if that's all you can be, then you ought to be happy. You're, you're full. And I dare say, there's not a person in this room, or a person in that congregation, or a person in this county, that doesn't want more. Now, maybe... It's more money. Maybe it's that red convertible that I've wanted all my life. <laughs> Maybe it's I want something else. You know, and I have a desire for more. That's not what he's talking about. That's not. We have a hole in our heart from birth. Started back in Genesis. And that hole is to be drawn closer to God. And no red convertible, no amount of money, no power in a job or position or any of that kind of stuff is ever going to fill that. We have that in our heart. And we, we it's an innate thing that's in us. The only way that gets filled is God fills it. Not some preacher, not some... Not some Bible translation, not some song we sing, not some, no. That's it. That's what we've got to look at. Uh, the desire for sin to be replaced by virtue and disobedience will be replaced by obedience, eager to serve the uh, word and will of God. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. The more we put aside what we have, the more we long for what God has. And I'm going to go back over here someplace. Go to uh, the object of spiritual hunger. We're all it's getting pretty close to it. Yeah. What's the goal in these two? It's for the unbeliever. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then the goal of the unbeliever is salvation. So the person hearing this and the person applying this of that crowd, of those disciples, of, of you and I, is it all starts with salvation. That's the goal, the initial goal. Now, it doesn't stop there, though. This is where I think a lot of Christians have trouble. Okay, I got baptized, I'm on church roll, I'm through. Nope, next. But the Christian, it's just the beginning of growth. And that's for the believer then, this takes us to what's called sanctification. For the believer, sanctification. Once we're in God's family, we, we yearn to grow in righteousness that we receive from trusting in Christ. When we were saved, we were at the depth down here. And we come into the family of God as babes. And if we don't grow, we stay a babe. And God didn't like that. What do you want for your children? What did you want for your children? I don't care if some of you were teachers. What did you want for your kids in your classroom? You wanted them to grow. You wanted them to have knowledge. You wanted them to progress to the next level. Mothers, you want your children to grow. Dads, you want your 
your, your children to, to learn to be responsible and, and to be the next generation. All of that stuff. Yeah, God wants that for his children. And that's called sanctification. That's growing in him. And the more, uh, the more we want to have that, we have this desire to be close to him. So that's, that's what we want. So everybody has a, an object. With that hole in our heart. Have a seat. We're just about to quit. Everybody has this, this object, this hole in there. That's either going to be satisfied. First, it has to be satisfied with salvation. And once we have salvation, that hole's still not satisfied. We want to go back for more. And I can tell you from my experience, I want more now than I wanted yesterday. If you'd have told me that when I was 20, 30, 40, 50, no. Nah, but somewhere around 50 or 60, it really hit me right between the eyes. You're not anywhere close to where I want you to be. Get on board. We're going for a ride. And it, and it began to impress me how much more there is to a right relationship with God what I started with. Unfortunately, now I get to this point, I realize it. I'm at the tail end of this thing. I, I, wow, it, how good could it have been if I got there earlier? That's my passion for you. Is don't wait, be like me. Okay, we got to wrap this up. So, Rob, go to the very last one. How do we know if we're spiritually hunger, hungry? Are you dissatisfied with yourself? Freedom from dependence on external things for satisfaction. Hunger is not satisfied with substitutes. In other words, if you're hungry, I can't sing you a song and you feel filled. Is that right? If you're hungry, you want something to eat. You want something that goes into the body. If you're not satisfied where you are, if you're not satisfied uh, with Christ, then you're gonna you, you know you have a spiritual hunger. Craving for God's word, pleasantness of things of God, hunger and thirst will make no conditions. They will seek and accept God's righteousness in whatever way He chooses to provide it and obey His commands, no matter how demanding they may be. You cannot say, God, I want to be satisfied, and this is what you've got to do to do it. Go back to humility. <clears throat> God, I want to be satisfied, and I'm willing to do whatever you want, in whatever way, whatever manner you have. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to be filled with your will. I want to be filled with your work. Typically, what I found out in my lifetime is didn't look anything like what I thought it ought to look like. <laughs> that that path wasn't through the Dr. Pepper line in Waco, Texas. <laughs> that path threw me through Pepsi, and I thought, oh no, I can't go through Pepsi. But <laughs> that's where it is. And so I'm driving a white Chevrolet Equinox. There is no red convertible. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Questions, comments. I've got excited. We got left. Late, it's late, we gotta go. There is a ton of there's just a ton of blessing in these ten verses. And there's also a tremendous roadmap that helps the non Christian see the need for Christ and helps the Christian see the need for growth. Once we get a hold of that and chew on the meat of that, we'll be able to look at what he then teaches them in the rest of that sermon on how to live.
Only then does that make sense. You can't take the Beatitudes out of the Sermon on the Mount and expect people to accept what comes later because they don't have the right attitude. They're not standing in the right position. I didn't understand what it meant to be as much as I had a military background, my father and grandfathers and all that kind of stuff, I never understood why you had to go through basic training until I went through basic training. <clears throat> to realize you had to be broken down so you could be trained back in the way you needed to be trained back to be an effective member of the military service. That's, I know that's a poor example, but we've got to be broken from the human nature so God can take us and make us what he wants us to be. And we can't do it without surrendering to him. And that's a process. It starts with salvation. And it's a process. The Beatitudes sets that stage for the application of what he wants for our lives that comes in the next two or the next two chapters, really. Mm -hmm. prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time and this opportunity you've given us just to study your word. We thank you, Lord, for who you are, what you are, what you mean to us, Lord. Help us, Father, in all things that will just glorify your precious name. Guide us, Father, and give us the strength and the openness of mind to be obedient to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And I apologize.